Greetings, everyone, and thanks for tuning back in for some more Transnatural Perspectives. This is the show where we're cultivating perspectives on society and culture across environments and landscapes. I'm your host, Josh Bennett. Whether you've been listening before or this is your first time to the show, you're very much welcome and welcome back. We're about six episodes in right now, but who is counting? Either way, I encourage you to check out our previous episodes with many diverse perspectives from all around the globe and please make sure that you are subscribed to the show wherever you may be listening whether it's on our audio podcast form or over there on our youtube channel don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share any way you can whether it be through social media or email or text message or smoke signal or carrier pigeon or bird calls or telepathy or even a good old conversation with your human or more than human friends we're not discriminating around here you get the point anyways best way you can support this show is through sharing keep us exponentially growing and flowing and don't forget to reach out to the show with any questions comments requests or if you want to be a guest even those good old funding opportunities are very welcome also just make sure you can stay up to date with the conversation you can do that by joining us on twitter facebook or simply send us a good old email at transnaturalpod at gmail.com. A few updates about the show. I've been enjoying your feedback from listeners all around. And one thing that has come up uh, is some great guest suggestions. And I really appreciate that because you make my work a little bit easier and also more interesting because I get to reach out to people that maybe I didn't know or I didn't think about. So keep it coming. Also, I've started adding timestamps in the descriptions below. So you can check that out. I'm doing my best to make the most accurate uh, list of topics that we talk about and then also the times during the show in which we talk about. Uh, Many people find this useful, I guess, uh, if they want to go back and refer to a certain point in the show or if they want to look through and get a little overview. I do hear sometimes people also skip around shows or they skip over the boring parts, but of course, that's not going to happen on this show, right? I've also like to let you know that I've started writing some articles related to this show And you can find that on Medium at transnatural-perspectives.medium.com. I'll leave a link for that in the description below. Just teeny tiny right now, but if you're into that, you can follow us on there and see how we grow textually. Now, on with the show. So I've got some good news. We now have listeners in over 36 countries around the world. That's on six different continents. This is totally awesome. And we're getting more transnatural every week. But there is one country I'm thinking of in particular that I don't see on that list. And I'm hoping that that changes after today's episode. Can you guess which country that is? Okay, I'll give you a few hints. Today's guest comes from the 144th largest country in the world. Located on the Mediterranean Sea, it boasts 14 national parks, alpine mountains, crystal clear coastlines, exceptional diversity. Still don't got it? Okay, the national bird is the eagle. Sorry, not USA. And there is not a single McDonald's within the borders of this country. Definitely not USA. That's right, everybody. We're talking about Albania. And I'm very excited to welcome our guest, my friend and former study companion, Claudia Kochi, to today's show. Claudia is joining us from Prespa National Park in Albania, where she currently specializes in transboundary nature preservation through her work as outdoor education programs and project coordinator with the PPNEA. PPNEA stands for the Organization for the Protection and Preservation of Natural Environment in Albania. As well, Claudia has been the professor of outdoor sports at the University of Sports in Tirana, the capital. As well, as a former Erasmus Mundus student herself, Claudia is a strong advocate and promoter of Erasmus exchange programs and projects in the region. As an aside, we do mention Erasmus and the Erasmus program quite a bit throughout this podcast, and we're going to explain that later in the podcast. But for those of you who haven't learned or don't know about the Erasmus program, because it is primarily a European program, and as we just said, we are on six continents now, um, it is an educational and cultural exchange program funded by the European Commission. The idea is to promote cultural, social, and academic exchanges between European learners. 
almost anyone can participate in an Erasmus program as it funds initiatives for everyone from teenagers to adults in any stage of their education, as well as it supports educators and lifelong learners of all types, even if you're not from Europe or the European Union. It's really an incredible opportunity and I encourage anyone listening to participate, no matter your age or where you're at in life. And yeah, it's usually free too. In fact, that's how Claudia and I met. We both participated in the Transcultural European Outdoor Studies Master Program from 2012 to 2014, where we studied nature and human connection uh, in the UK, Norway, and Germany, and all throughout Europe. It really was great to catch up with Claudia since we haven't seen each other since we graduated back in 2014. She's really been up to a lot, and I think you're going to find this episode really interesting and informative. Everybody, enjoy, and you're going to hear from me on the other side with some reflections. Claudia, how are you doing, and where, where are you today? So, hello, hi. I'm in Prespa National Park. Um... That's a, that's a protected area divided by three countries. There are two lakes, three countries, Albania, Greece, and North Macedonia. And here we have, uh, we have an office that we just opened very recently, uh, last February, before the whole coronavirus happened. <laughs> uh, lucky with the inauguration. So I'm here today and I'll be here for the next three or four days working from this area, doing different things. Uh, with my colleague. We have a staff here. And yes. Yeah, so you're in Prespa National Park right now. And you said this is uh, actually, that's, uh, that was going to be one of my first questions. Actually, it's on it's on the border. It's a park that's on the border of, of uh, Albania. Wow. Macedonia. North Macedonia and Greece. And Greece. Okay. So, and, and for our, for our listeners out there who might not have realized this already, so I, I probably mentioned this already, but Claudia is from Albania. You're from Albania, but are you in the are you on the Albania side of the park right now, or how does that work? I, I'm really in the border next to North Macedonia, but I'm in the Albanian side in one of the in one of the villages here. Basically, there are nine villages uh, uh, just here in the big lake. Uh, and then there's a small lake still connected to this. Uh, and there, there are three other villages um, that's overall from our side. In the Macedonian side, it's a, it's a nice town. That's the only town in the whole basin, basically. And then in Greece, it's again uh, a few villages, touristic ones, very nice. Uh, also there are found the biggest uh, colony of pelicans. Dalmatian pelicans and white pelicans of the world. So they are breeding there <laughs> and coming to Albania side and North Macedonian side for feeding, basically. Amazing. That sounds so awesome. Actually, that sounds, I'm really excited to learn more about this area because I mean, the last time, I mean, as you know, I'm from the United States, <clears throat> I'm from Florida. And uh, last time I saw a pelican was when I was in, uh, wait, no, wait, pelican? You have pelicans? Pelicans, yes, yes. Pelicans. Last time I saw a pelican was when I was in Florida. I didn't even know we had pelicans in Europe. So we're only a few minutes into this conversation. I'm, my mind is already blown. Um, that's wild. So before we get into a little bit more about what you're doing right there in the National Park, I just want to um, let our listeners know that me and Claudia have actually known each other for quite a while. We go way back. I think what we first met back in 2012 through the uh, Transcultural European Outdoor Studies Erasmus program. That's, that's a big mouthful that they've given <laughs> us to carry with us through the rest of our lives. And we're going to get a bit more into that program in a little bit. And I think the last time we saw each other was at the graduation in Marburg in Germany back in 2014. So yeah, we go way back and we've uh, spent a lot of really great times together, kind of journeying through our master's studies, uh, researching across yeah, yeah. borders and cultures in Europe. Um, but Claudia, give us a little um, clue about maybe before we get into that too, what have you been up to since you've graduated from the Transcultural European Outdoor Studies program? Can you give us some highlights from the past uh, five five six or six years, years? Yeah. yeah almost six years how actually. did you get from germany to uh prespa national park in albania yeah 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, Teos really changed everything uh, for me. From political sciences, uh, the, the degree I had before in Albania, then going to do this Master of Arts in three different countries with all of you. <laughs> we were a group of people from all over, from all over the world, basically, from different continents. Um, after the graduation, and probably I should uh, I should say that it was the period even before graduating that I got uh, I got to meet uh, PP Nea. That's the NGO I work uh, now with protection and preservation of natural environment in Albania. So I, I got back uh, from Germany uh, sometime during uh, the end of the master, uh, master period when I was doing the master thesis, I decided to come back to Albania uh, because I was doing research about it basically. And then I, I got to see in the social media an, a, not, a notification, an advertisement about a summer school, a transboundary summer school in one of the parks that Pipinia was organizing. It was again Albania and Macedonia bordering two NGOs. And I applied, I applied for that. Um, I went in that summer school for 10 days I joined them and apparently they were a bit uh, <laughs> uh, they were a bit fascinated from uh, my abilities to, to stay outdoors that's all results of teos so i could manage to stay in a tent <laughs> for uh, one week and then i didn't I, I never did that before and it was the first time i was camping in albania actually uh, also i i really Incredible. mingled a lot with people in the group so uh, that was noticed at that time, and they were looking for someone for the for the position of uh, of the officer here in Prespa. It was very far from Tirana because the NGO is uh, has its main office in Tirana, in the capital of Albania. Apparently, nobody wanted to take this position up here. Wow! <laughs> there were a few there were a few uh, offers from people from the city nearby of the park, uh, but. Uh, well, definitely they, they didn't go on until the end uh, stage of the recruitment. So they proposed me <laughs> if I wanted to stay in Albania. I, I did not even graduate yet, basically. I was wow. waiting for, for the graduation ceremony that, that happened before, really two months before the graduation. And it looked very interesting to me, uh, this Transboundary Park, you know, we studied transcultural studies. Here, Absolutely. the people in this area, uh, they speak all languages, Greek, Macedonian, Albanian. Uh, and it just sounded like the perfect transcultural project in that way. I thought, look at that. And the proposition was to come to live here in Prespa for six months at the beginning of the job. So I could uh, uh, build contacts in the area, uh, meet stakeholders, get to know people, so we could really plan our, our uh, opening of the office in the upcoming years. And uh, it just sounded <laughs> really, really interesting. And I accept it, of course. So since then, I'm just working for this NGO. I, I do different things, but uh, I keep uh, the position for Prespa. It's just that now a bit, I'm a bit more uh, uh, retired from the area because I come to visit uh, once in two months or three months just for supervision or when I'm needed to do different things. I'm staying at the main office in Tirana, but I spent six months here in the beginning and that was a total new experience for me from so from Germany here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was quite a journey. Yeah. So your kind of transcultural experience, um, ability to journey and be outside that we all kind of went through in the TOS program on varying levels, uh, seemed like a very useful, uh, skill to have probably, probably the most useful skill to have. Now I'm curious, what was that like in those first six months, uh, getting in touch with the area and, you know, or maybe you can expand upon like what is happening in Prespa, like give us a little tour of the landscape and the culture there, if you can. Uh, 
Before deciding to really accept the job, I did a scoping visit. I came to visit the area because I never was here. I was never here before. Uh, and uh, the landscape is, is really stunning, it's especially usually we say if we compare it to Ohrid, maybe you've seen photos of Ohrid Lake or in Macedonia, that's more famous, mm -hmm. far more famous than Prespa. Here in Prespa, nature is really almost untouched, let's say. Uh, the lakes are, are big. Um, I can say uh, how much, how deep is like goes to 50 more meters depth. Very the lakes, deep. yeah, it is. <laughs> Fish, fishing uh, is one of the main activities mm -hmm. in our side, at least. It's a mountainous area as well. So the lakes are surrounded by, by mountains up to 1000 meters. Um, no, up to 2,000 meters, really, but the altitude is almost 1,000 meters here where we are, 800 from sea level in Albania. Wow. Uh, the, the area is, is uh, located in the southern part of, of our country, so, but the villages are uh, not very developed. <laughs> I can say in the sense of uh, offering uh, touristic offers, even though there are some uh, hotels found in the area that you can come, most of the people come here just to have a good lunch with good fish from the cities nearby or from the other two countries, but there are not many uh, tourists who would come and stay over for different reasons. Maybe it's not very promoted, it, it, it really depends. But uh, people here do everything uh, for, so their connection, I, I mean, with, with nature is, is really direct. So they, they do fishing, they have craves, they do beans, <laughs> they do everything for their uh, everyday lives. So they're, they're, uh, they're self-subsidizing basically in this area. Yeah, a lot of self-sufficient. Not, not many pesticides around. Very uh, organic still. Do you do you know about like how many people actually live in the park? There are uh, about five thousand people, all and all, really, in the Albanian side, in all uh, the two areas, in the two lakes. Okay. Uh, and and the the population is shrinking every year really they they decide to emigrate in usa you know really? they are famous to go to usa in this side <laughs> yes i remember i used to work at a pizza place run by my boss i remember that story as yes. well for some albanians with yes. albanians or something like that yeah. yes yes they, they were from albania yes that's a, that's a story for another podcast <laughs> uh, we have a uh, we have here a few primary schools but all in all there are no more than 100 200 children really in all the area um, and very very few young people because they go mostly to to study abroad and sometimes they come back sometimes most of the times they don't even though we were lucky because my colleague she, she came back from Bulgaria and luckily we found her and she's working here for us basically in the office. But so yeah. is it, um, I'm, I'm curious because this sounds like a very special region, like um, that it's, you know, kind of deep in the mountains and it's also kind of transcultural because you have all, uh, three different countries in this area. So would you, is there anything, um, like what is the connection that, um, I would say like the rest of Albania has to this area. Cause I mean, is this like a unique area in Albania and like, what is the general, would you say the general perception of like nature and connecting to nature throughout Albania? The area, the area is very, very unique. I can say for me it's still unique, even though it's many years that I'm, I'm working, I'm working here because uh, it's quite isolated, I'd say, and Albanians mostly prefer to just uh, uh, they in the in the past years they are traveling as well for 
to tourism or for recreation, but uh, they are more like daily daily tourists or just you know going out, taking a photo. You don't really see them doing many activities. Uh, but for Prespa, it's Prespa is mostly unknown, really, mostly unknown. It's there. If if you tell them, uh, if you show them pictures of the lake, they they will not think uh, that this lake is in Albania. Wow, okay, <laughs> that's so... that's a level of uh, no not information around. Also, the small lake, unfortunately, it's uh, it's uh, it's been covered a part of it by reed beds. Some some plants. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if if you know them basically. Uh, from some irrigation problem, okay. and uh, the media has has images only of the small lake of Prespa, and that's the projection that Albanians are getting for for Prespa. And coming up here, even though it's not so far, it's the three hundred uh, sorry three hours and a half from Tirana. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean Albania is. Um... Albania is not the biggest country. So, but I mean, for people living in Albania, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that it was too far away for people from the city. Nobody wanted to work all the way out there in the mountains. So has there been, um, tell us about some of the initiatives and some of the projects that you've been working on since you've been working at the Prespa Park and with the PPNA. Uh, we... We've been involved uh, with work in this park for many years, uh, since 1993. Mm -hmm. The NGO uh, Pipinia is the oldest one in the country, in Albania. So it's almost as old as me. <laughs> so in a few <laughs> months, we will celebrate its 30th anniversary. So our our founder, uh, he passed away. Uh, he contributed to the establishment of the park, basically. He prepared together with other uh, professors from Tirana, from the University of Natural Sciences. They created the NGO and they were the first ones to do uh, uh, international conferences uh, in this area, in, in Korcha, it's not far from here, and Pogradeci. Uh, because Okay, I'm jumping from one part to another, but to give you an idea, Prespa is also connected to Ohrid Lake. So it's in a higher altitude than Ohrid. And water from Prespa with underwater channels feeds Ohrid Lake. And Ohrid Lake is, is a UNESCO uh, site, basically. Fortunately, Albanian site as well. So it's a World Heritage uh, site. Mm. And the conferences uh, they were doing in Pogradeci, our side of Ohrid, and in Korcha. Uh, so even though much of, a lot of work was done here before uh, in terms of biodiversity uh, protection or monitoring. So they were monitoring uh, different uh, wildlife species, mammals, birds, habitats, flowers, butterflies, all, all of it basically, water level, water quality parameters. The park was established in 1999 uh, through the work that was done from, the, from our NGO. Uh, but then we understood that it was really important to work with uh, governments and work with NGOs and people uh, in, in all the countries uh, of the basin. Otherwise, if we're not coordinated to protect the waters and the animals, they know no borders. <laughs> and, the, and, you know, waste from our side just goes on the other side very easily. And the pelicans are found on the other side. And <laughs> so we're sharing everything. And it was very important to work together. That's why in 2013, we decided to really uh, put together serious efforts for PRESPA. And we created a network called PRESPANET with two other organizations from the two other countries. And that was really like in 2014, I joined, uh, I joined the network as the officer and coordinator for Albania. And we are basically three coordinators who work together on daily basis. So with my colleagues from Greece and Macedonia, we talk almost 
uh, maybe not every day, even though every day, at least every week, we discuss all of our work and uh, what's happening in our sites, trying to exchange information. So the network is still uh, an environmental network. And what we're doing is we're working to preserve nature in Prespa, to protect animals, uh, to uh, work with local communities. So we prepare, uh, for example, newsletters or videos or and we in all three languages and we share that to the local population and so they can understand what's happening on the other side. So trying to bring them together. But mostly is research and studies, the work that we're doing. Uh, and then parallelly to that, we do uh, a lot of education about the animals that we protect. So we, for example, we have uh, environmental education about special wild plants of the area or about the Balkan lynx, because we have Balkan lynx in Albania, even though lynx uh, in many countries has uh, been gone extinct. We have, we have this animal, <laughs> this subspecies in the Albania and in Macedonia and Kosovo that uh, is critically endangered, but is still surviving basically. Yeah. So um, I mean, uh, we can talk. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a few, it. I'm gonna ask you a few things about uh, what you, uh, what you just uh, told us about. So I'm uh, going back to a little bit about the, um, you know, the working together of all these different colleagues uh, from the three different countries. I mean, this is very interesting, um, you know, from, you know, it's always interesting exchanging with cultures. But um, let's say before this um, kind of, um, before this collaboration began, um, uh, and you made it sound like, yeah, it's important for the people in these different communities too, like the local people living in the park to have like a better understanding of what's going on the other side. So were there some challenges with that uh, beforehand uh, with between like the different cultures uh, across borders? Challenges? Well, throughout the history, there have been even uh, different wars of course happening in mm -hmm. the area in, in in all three countries uh but i i can say that the, the differences are not very much present i think among people maybe uh politics <laughs> is uh, is a bit more complex mm -hmm. and political agendas are different even though an agreement was signed here in Prespa very recently, two years ago, uh, about the change of the name of uh, North Macedonia, was it? I'm not That's right, yeah. Sure mm -hmm. about this, we will, uh, yeah, check this later on <laughs> before sharing. So the idea is that um, I think people, they, they already exchange a lot among them because in, in the Greek side, they have a, it, Greece is in, is in European Union. It's definitely in a more developed level than uh, the two other countries. So people from Albania or even North Macedonia would go to work in the Greek side uh, with either services or different services basically uh, in, the, in their area. Also, people from Albania would go in the Macedonian side. In Macedonia, they grow so many apples. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the, the region is, is very well known all over the country and on our side as well. So I think people really, uh, really are at the borders and at least Albanians, they are going even for shopping in the Macedonian side, like here mm. across borders. It's just 20 minutes, the next town. For them, it's more near to go there than to go to Korta, the city that is nearby on, mm -hmm. uh, on the Albanian side. Uh, but of course, uh, sometimes we as uh, environmentalists or other organizations uh, are focused on our objectives, which people don't really understand. They might want direct support or they want, uh, they want to see some big changes that maybe the government, it's government's duty to do, like infrastructure or more employment, 
uh, or more uh, things happening in, in an area to become a touristic destination. And this has not uh, been <laughs> really progressing for many years. So uh, in all the 30 years of democracy here, they, they still have not seen, people have not seen that big change happening. They still don't see that nature can be of profit to them, that tourism, ecotourism, or uh, different uh, agro-tourism uh, ideas that are working in other areas in Albania, they, they, you don't see this happening yet here, even though there have been some trainings uh, from different uh, organizations or a lot of money has been put by German government as well. People still feel a bit left uh, left aside, and and it's that's that's the biggest challenge for us really because uh, when you're present in the area, they, it's very easy for them. When you talk to people, they tell to you all their problems and they confuse you with the government as well <laughs> many times. So, and you're talking about the protection of environment. That's um, if you don't provide alternatives to them for heating, and you just say don't cut the forest. It's of course challenging. Ah, that's very interesting because I mean, this is kind of um, a, a small example of you know what kind of the globe is experiencing in general. Is you know, there's this people are you know the average person is just trying to satisfy their basic needs, uh, whether it be for food or water, or, you know, just like peace or you know, just a stable place to live and. On the other side, we have these organizations like your organization and, and global organizations that are, you know, trying to save the environment, which is directly involved, uh, directly connected with the survival of the people living in the park, of course. <clears throat> but yeah, it sounds like you're still having um, challenges uh, communicating that or like having people to understand that. So, and have you, I mean, this is still like an ongoing um, kind of issue of c communicating these ideas ongoing challenge yes uh, i mean we uh, our network is successfully going on <laughs> mm -hmm. and we and it, it will go on for as as long as we want to work together mm -hmm. uh, and we started a, a project two years ago three years ago almost, uh, because we're, we're now reaching its end, but we will continue for, a, for a, at least three other years uh, together with uh, other partners to work in the area. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we will manage to uh, organize more meetings uh, where we can bring people together across borders either fishermen traveling to to Greece uh, or uh, or other or fishermen from Greece coming to our side or from North Macedonia uh, people are asking for for support for that they want to meet with farmers on the other sides they want more uh, things to happen in this area and we've been we've been consulting them when preparing the new project phase uh, as well as uh, the authorities here, the local authorities, which are not many and are not very big, because even the building we have here is actually uh, in uh, is in is a property of the municipality uh, of the area, the the only municipality on our side in the park. So we we try to work in partnership with them as well, uh, so that they feel that we can we can support them because many many responsibilities for the park are shared among the municipality staff they have they don't have a department about environment but they have some envir environmental uh, inspectors sort of people in in their uh, institution the national park and of course the NGOs who are present here. I mean, we are the ones who are really present here with an office. <laughs> uh, and, and I think the, the office that we opened here, it's, uh, it, it has uh, put many expectations on us from people in the village or in the villages nearby uh, because they've seen in one year lifetime of the office less than one year, 
they've seen events happening here, uh, other NGOs coming to organize here their activities because we have uh, we have envisaged the the place as a as a hub sort of as well. The community can come and uh, organize some meetings here. So it, here even they voted before. Amazing. <laughs> so it's uh, so one of the rooms. It can again be used for uh, for the elections when <laughs> when it's going to happen the next ones if they really want to continue their tradition. So the idea is to really be open to them. We want also to have another staff to join here the area. So when we're going, uh, uh, we're we're taking a programmatic approach. So we will have programs three-year programs to monitor, of course, do research and monitoring uh, with different uh, methods uh, of wildlife. And here you have all the wildlife and just really two days ago, <laughs> uh, we even had the lynx passing by. And, uh, we don't know, maybe maybe we have a small population of lynx as well here in Prespa, and that's the biggest uh, of, the, of the mammals we have present in Albania. Um, but also we organize summer schools, transboundary ones with universities, or we get uh, students, university students from the cities nearby to come to Prespa, stay over in our office, uh, because it's a, as well a field station office, <laughs> like I'm saying <laughs> right now. Uh, so they come and do research and get practical experience uh, with, uh, with my colleagues here or colleagues in the other two countries. Uh, small steps, but I think the atmosphere around is uh, is changing slowly, slowly, following also the example of our colleagues in Greece, who they have really done an amazing job. They have opened a cultural center, they organize events every weekend for the village, trying to revitalize re re or revive the area, yeah. really. Yeah, no, it sounds actually, when you explain it, it sounds incredible. It sounds like you've had actually quite a significant impact on the area, uh, even though I know it's still, maybe it's hard sometimes to communicate to everybody the importance of these things. You're showing, you know, like you said, in a very pragmatic way, uh, you're creating like a hub and you're creating exchange. Uh, this sounds amazing. Bravo. On our side, at least we we were uh, living under a, a, a totalitarian regime in Albania for mm -hmm. 50 years. We were under communism. So only in uh, in the 1990 we had we, we saw the fall of communism in our country when our leader passed away, basically, and that mm -hmm. was uh, the end of the system. Uh, and then we we started a new <laughs> a new era with uh, with a, the democracy installed. So before before the nineties, it was absolutely not allowed to cross the borders. Everybody who would cross the borders would just be in shot basically. Wow. <laughs> so uh, the the exchange was not happening at all mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the area here as well um uh, falls uh, falls as as part of uh, of a big of a big uh, green area which starts from finland and goes down to greece and that's called a european green belt um so all this area and here bordering, so all this border area uh, was was be before with the Iron Curtain in Europe, it was divided. And all this borderline going through all Europe and Albania, and I mean Balkans and then uh, Albania, of course, as part of the Balkans, was not touched by human activity or people were not really really allowed to go next to the borders it was all uh, patrolled or controlled basically uh, and that had a very good uh, result for nature <laughs> because nature <laughs> just nourished and uh, and 
that's what uh, that's what it was like here in this in this area before so before the 90s uh, you uh, probably just uh, natural phenomena would would have happened in the area and what what people had really shaped uh, the landscape on, with their activities and and nothing much so the whole uh, the whole exchange and opening happened in during these 30 years from 1990s to now. And uh, before, uh, I'm, I'm really not good with this uh, numbers and uh, years. Oh, numbers, the, <laughs> it's, it happened back in the 90s, <laughs> sometime between now and then. Centuries, centuries ago, though, it was inhabited yeah. even by monks uh, who would live by the lake. And uh, there are found several eremit churches where the monks would live. Uh, in in our uh, in our area in uh, in Albania, and that's also one of the touristic potentials that the area can offer. Uh, you can take a boat trip to the lake for up to four or five hours, depending uh, uh, how much time you want to spend. You cannot cross uh, the neutral area <laughs> and go to the other countries with a with a boat. Even though this has been discussed for many years among governments, if such trip could be possible or if hiking uh, can happen across the three countries without borders, but really you have to cross the borders. These uh, bureaucracies have not changed much. So it's just the same. You can cycle through the area though, very nicely. See, this, this, is my, this sounds like it's gotta be our, my next bike trip. Sounds great. Um, wow. So yeah, yeah, you still have some pretty hard borders there because yeah, you're Albania. For those of you who don't know, it's like right on the border with the EU, with your, with uh, with Greece, and then you've got Macedonia next door. So, um, so what? So you said a lot of people, Albanians from the city, will like come there for a day, or, you know, for a day trip or something like that. Do you find yourself? having um like how's how is it with international tourism i mean of course i guess you have some people coming from greece some people coming from macedonia but this is not maybe so international uh how about international tourists the international tourists here are mostly scientists or uh, students uh, who would come and do research because really it's like the perfect laboratory you can uh, find <laughs> you can uh, encounter here amazing biodiversity species that have uh, that are of uh, importance all over Europe or worldwide uh, recognized so what you what you meet here is just scientists mostly coming to visit the area for studying it and um, not not many not many other tourists yeah no but that I mean this sounds again kind of going back to the it sounds like the iron curtain turned into the green belt and it, it, it went completely from this, uh, the iron curtain, it went completely from this, you know, blockade, you know, build a wall, you know, sad kind of thing where, you know, I mean, you can't cross the border. Nobody, nobody can go in this. And, but that whole time the nature was flourishing and now it's become this amazing resource for research. And also, as you were talking about, you know, cultural exchange, and we all come to find out one thing I always, you know, that always struck me, especially, you know, studying in transculturalism and everything like that is that, you know, you'll go to regions in the Balkans, like where you live, or you'll go to region like Germany, the, the, you know, countries in Germany, Switzerland, France, and you'll say, oh, well, we, we eat these kind of, you know, potatoes here. And, oh, those people eat those potatoes over there. But if you go all the way to Berlin, they eat a different kind of potatoes over there. So I find it so amazing that sometimes regionalism, like the region that um, you are, is almost more important sometimes than maybe the, the political country that you live in, or like the political borders that you live in. So, and, and once again, here we have a perfect example of, nature kind of facilitating that and then nice people like you trying to kind of be the the guide between the nature and the culture and, and bring everybody together so <laughs> that's amazing um you put it in a very nicely you you put the situation in a very nice context <laughs> yeah that, that's no but i think that's that's what you're doing here it's 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 
it's uh, a lot of things that I imagine in my head and, and you're actually that I that I theorize about, but you're actually doing that in practice. It's good praxis that you've got going on here. This is amazing. So what in this green belt now, this green belt area, what kind of just a little overview of what kind of research are people doing there right now? These scientists, science tourists. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're so, really tourists. They're probably working there, right? <laughs> well, uh, most mostly is but they're they are coming to uh, research uh, the water quality of the lake. They they are researching the different uh, fish species. We on our side, and of course together with other with the other colleagues from the two other countries. We are setting camera traps uh, and they automatically flash when wildlife is passing by. Mm. And we have uh, put these cameras in all the three sides. So there's no escape for mammals in Prespa. <laughs> Wherever they go, they're going to be on the flash. <laughs> uh, in <and> camera. <laughs> yes, and we've got really nice photos. And that's how people really believe that we're doing job. <laughs> 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 or they don't even believe that uh, these are found here unless you you tell them or they go when they go in the forest uh, to walk they they finally <laughs> they see something there hidden under the trees and uh, they're curious curious about it uh, so yeah it's uh, it, it's mostly wildlife research uh, really um, cultural uh, Culturally, the area has not been researched so much or for the archaeology, at least to my knowledge, for, uh, for uh, these past years, so these recent years, basically, not, not really much. So that's why we really want to encourage them through these summer schools uh, in, from, from the three countries and beyond, because we try to also uh, collaborate with the European universities. Uh, for different uh, topics, for example, we uh, our colleagues worked with the Wageningen University from uh, from the Netherlands. Mm. Uh, they were bringing expertise here to to study the the water vegetation uh, around, and they were bringing this uh, training. Uh, uh, experience for students from the three countries, so we can because we have a really a lack of. Uh, a lack of experts around in all the three countries to study different uh, to study different biodiversity parameters. But at least in Albania, students think mostly uh, that studying natural sciences is becoming a biologist or a teacher biologist, but they they don't have this uh, overview or perspective that uh, they they can work. At, on research, really on the ground about uh, about about their studies, so they can really experience and, and learn uh, how to do that uh, in the field and not in the classroom. So uh, amazing! Yeah. So uh, that so it sounds like there is a a big need for more, you know, cultural and like hard science research. Uh, in the Prespa area. And I think that we have a lot of researchers listening out there right now. So they might actually be interested in something like this, especially, so is there, is this at all connected? Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead right now, but is this, at, is, this, is, this is there funding for this kind of research? Or is this at all connected with your work that you're doing with Erasmus? Uh, through Erasmus, uh, I'm trying to promote the different programs uh, that uh, the European uh, Commission is supporting. So it's full funding coming from the European Union to study uh, on master levels uh, for different really disciplines and mostly is uh, interdisciplinary uh, programs that are happening. Uh, in Albania, we have universe we have also universities who are partners. Uh, in this consor in consortia from Erasmus, but we don't have um, the local universities here that are located uh, nearby the Prespa Basin. They don't, uh, they're not part of uh, fundamental exchange uh, schemes, basically, but we're, 
we're trying to help them or we have at least offered our assistance to help them apply for these funds uh, for the European Union. Also uh, trying to promote the area. So uh, also bringing the university here basically. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we try to encourage and empower students from the cities nearby here and not so much from Tirana, even though that's also important because even students from Tirana, if they come together with uh, local students from here, uh, we are sure that uh, that also uh, brings about very nice results, both culturally for the education or for the exchange or for different reasons. Uh, on our side as, as an organization, we are offering the office spaces here for international uh, students. Of course, not many of them at the same time. <laughs> There's a limited capacity, but we are offering the, uh, the office space to stay here over for free and do research. In some other projects of PPNEA, we also um, uh, recruit some students to join our project so they can gather data in the field for bird monitoring so they can do the master thesis with us and we are supporting their their research in the ground with small funding but of course the uh, unfortunately we're we are uh, we are just an we are an NGO who has a uh, has its scope objectives and vision and we want to include students in our work uh, and help them get this experience, but we cannot support much. But of course, with this European Commission funds, they can apply for research. They can apply through Horizon 2020 and get research funds to, to, to do their own project as an individual or in cooperation with us. Uh, Pipinia was born from the academia. We were funded by a group of professors from the University of Tirana with a special degree of Academia of Sciences in that, in, in that time, because there, was, there were no NGO uh, sector existing, basically. Then we turned into an NGO when that appeared. So that's in the core of the NGO, uh, NGO's work, really, to work with young people and youth. But people, uh, young, youngsters should be more, uh, more aware of all these opportunities and should have more ambitious uh, on themselves to apply and be persistent. Sometimes uh, you see them spending more time around in the coffee places. <laughs> that's, a, that's a critique I have. Uh, and sometimes they get discouraged about uh, the list of documents that uh, it needs to be provided to apply for Erasmus. <laughs> oh, you need English, you need uh, a certificate. Well, you, you, you should put some efforts, nothing comes uh, out for free, but you know, you are aware uh, as well how important our degree was and that is recognized uh, all over the Europe and other, other parts of the world as well. So it's really what the individual can do out of it, I think, in my opinion. It's uh, after the Erasmus, it's, it depends what, what you want to do with uh, all the knowledge you, you have acquired. You want to go for a proper job or what you want to do, but the perspective uh, should be good. <laughs> Yeah. So, so if somebody wanted to, so what could we tell people out there listening? If somebody wanted to say, come study birds or some kind of re do some research with, uh, with you out there in the lodge in the middle of Prespa Park with PP, any, a, no, a. P -P -A? yeah. <laughs> um, what would you, how, what would you recommend? Uh, about uh, how can someone come do uh, some research with you? Should they just contact you, or, uh, or... they should? Uh, yeah, they should contact the NGO or contact me. They should go to the website of Pipinea, uh, send an email, uh, and we also have their integrated uh, form that you can sign up as a volunteer or for. Uh, 
for more uh, long term involvement do you do you <laughs> need to send do you us need an to, email do you need to speak albanian if you're like uh, from the international sphere uh, to do research uh, I, I think if you're working just with nature and not really much, <laughs> much with people, <laughs> English is fine. Also with uh, our NGO staff, English is absolutely fine because we, wo we work in partnership with, uh, with other NGOs also all over the Balkans. Uh, here we share a lot of parks with Kosovo, uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, Greece, we're sharing many of our areas, natural areas. So English uh, is working well. Uh, and here in Prespa, I think they, uh, they understand English as well. Uh, of course, people of the age of my parents, not really, but uh, I, I'm sure it can be facilitated. Uh, so I would just uh, say that they can send us an email, send us their research interest. Uh, they can check their our initiatives, uh, the different initiatives we have for rivers, for species, for uh, cultural landscapes. Uh, it depends. We're really working all over the country, but we don't have the opportunity to host them. Yeah, the you're, so yeah, you're not <laughs> providing any kind, your organization doesn't provide any kind of funding or like something from the Albanian government or something like that. This is all external funding. It's all funding coming from uh, other, uh, other European, non-Albanian Okay. Bonding. Good to know. <laughs> so that's so, Germany and, yeah, so and EU. <laughs> you hear that, everybody. There's a lot of great things to go research in Albania. There's a lack of people doing it. And there's lots of funding throughout Europe and maybe throughout the world to go do it. So this is a very good opportunity. Now, um, if you're looking for some ideas, if you're sitting out there right now saying, hmm, what should I write my thesis on or my dissertation? Think about Prespa, Albania. There's a lot going on there. Not a lot of people trying to get in there. Um, and also, I feel a little bad because we've been talking about Erasmus this whole time and I didn't give a good explanation of what that is because, of course, we have a lot of international listeners that are not from the Europe, from Europe, European area where Erasmus is primarily offered and is kind of a thing. So I know you work a lot with Erasmus. We've both studied in Erasmus programs. Um uh, what, can you just give a little explanation of what the Erasmus program is and then just tell us a little bit about um, any more of your work that you're doing uh, with the Erasmus program in Europe? So that's right. Uh, not everyone maybe knows about Erasmus. Erasmus uh, Plus is now the, the program of the European Union for education, youth, and culture, let's say, all together under one umbrella. Um, Erasmus Mundus is the program that includes master programs uh, from, from all over Europe and also partnerships with universities in, in other continents like Canada, Africa, well, USA as well. So the program turned 30 uh, three years ago <laughs> in 2017 as well. So it's all about 30 anniversaries in the past wow. years. <laughs> and uh, the, they, they, they offer full scholarships. It's open for uh, young people, but not only because at least for masters, there's no age limit. Last year there was a there was a student 60 years old registered for Erasmus. So, Fantastic! So knowledge is encouraged all over uh, the world and as a life uh, lifelong life learning. learning experience yes. and long learning. Uh, so it's open for all uh, all the worlds and you're competing with people all over the world and you come to Europe and you study in at least two universities two different countries. Uh, for a two years period. And now uh, we had many, many young people profiting from this scholarship from Albania and the Balkans. Uh, and uh, the phenomena of brain drain, of course, <laughs> is present more than ever in our countries because 
people they they profit from this scholarship they study and they decide to just remain in the countries where where they studied and uh, get uh, get a job there and integrate themselves in in another culture in another country uh, and that's been a uh, that's that's been uh, really our countries have suffered from this and from other scholarship schemes as well from german uh, scholarship schemes or from us scholarship uh, schemes uh, what uh, myself and a few other uh, people who studied with erasmus mundus did was that in 2017 we decided to uh, establish a regional alumni association of uh, people from the Western Balkans who studied in Europe. Uh, and we wanted to, first of all, create a community for ourselves uh, of those who returned back or those who are still uh, studying there. So we could really help each other in finding a job or uh, overcoming uh, difficulties before, during, or after the study period. Uh, but also we wanted to we wanted to the com the community of those who studied abroad to be integrated back and uh, be noticed by our governments and give our contribution back and all the knowledge that we 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 received uh, in in Europe we wanted to apply that in our country to improve our policies and luckily we had the support and we have the support of the European Commission for this so we get some annual uh, funding to organize different meetings uh, in in the Balkans or to go to Brussels to discuss with them about uh, our progress um, and also they have really helped us to come closer to our officials in our countries uh, without their help it was not so easy to be noticed we're lobbying so some of us can get some uh, employment in the public administrations of our countries. It's it's not uh, it's not going really great, but uh, well, we're not giving up. Uh, so the the association now is working, of course, remotely. We work online. We don't have offices. We're not registered. Uh, but it has a it has a website and we have all our social media and uh, they can everyone can contact us other either for partnerships or for or students who want to learn more uh, about the programs and how they can apply we have we have different working teams and departments all online about research promotion professional development and it's a whole community, so it's uh, very worth joining in. We also do parties. Now we're not doing that anymore <laughs> because of COVID-19, but we can get online, grab a coffee and uh, overcome this difficult period together. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds like you really are, became like the model Erasmus Mundus graduate. You know, taking it to the <laughs> fullest extent. I mean, and you even went back, like you said, it's kind of a problem. Sometimes people don't go back to their home country <laughs> like myself. Uh, we are all <laughs> products here of uh we're all products on this on this show right now of the erasmus mundus program and uh, it's really great that you went to i mean i myself i i am I'm, I'm i'm envious in a way i would love to be able to do something like that back in the states there's very little i think communication uh between the, the eu europe and the states when it comes to erasmus programs but if you're out there listening anywhere around the world i cannot recommend it enough you don't have to be from europe uh, at all. Uh, you don't have to be from the European Union as you're listening to two people not from the European Union right now <laughs> exactly. talk about a fantastic Erasmus program um, that we were in the Transcultural European Outdoor Studies program. And there's just like a number of programs that you can go through. And Erasmus is not just master's programs, but they also fund just, it's more of an exchange initiative at, at the end of the day, I think, because people go on Erasmus during their bachelor's degrees, they do Erasmus programs in their master's. I know I myself have been on a lot of Erasmus, Erasmus uh, lifelong learning, like youth exchanges, where you can get sent off to learn about all kinds of cool stuff and do workshops and continue your education even after you graduate. Usually all of this stuff is paid for which is amazing so you can kind of 
travel, meet people, you know, from all around the world in Berlin or in Turkey or wherever you want to, wherever you, wherever you find. Um, and, and yeah, it just goes on. I even did EVS. I did the European voluntary service. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so. <laughs> you get a certificate for that. And all that is really helpful when you apply for, for the masters because uh, you don't need to have very, very good grades to be, uh, to apply for the program. So there, there's no minimum or, of, uh, or average of grades that you need to apply. It's more uh, the motivation yes. and the personal achievements that you've had through different uh, involvements that you had. So basically it's just proving that you're worth it and you really want, <laughs> yeah, you really want to progress with that program. So really I, I encourage everyone to apply and you can apply up to three programs. Yeah. It's really uh, before incredible. the program had also PhD programs uh, again with mobility, but now uh, everyone who is interested on, on uh, PhDs and research, they should look for Horizon 2020. That's again EU funding or Marie Curie funding. All right, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. Um, speaking of which, very nice segue, Claudia, because I wanted to ask you. I know, I know, we've been on the on the on the mic for a while now, but it's a it's great talking to you. But I wanted to ask you a few more things before I let you go. And I heard that you are starting a PhD and what, what is this all about? Uh, well, that's one of those also very big uh, benefits of the Erasmus Mundus Masters because it brings you closer to you at least two or three universities, sometimes even to six universities, partnerships. <laughs> uh, and that uh, gives the opportunity to be, uh, to be in communication with uh, great research centers and, and professors. Uh, and it's important that they know you and that they know your, uh, your progress and your uh, research interests. And uh, Professor uh, Chris Loins, <laughs> Our Chris dear Lawrence. professor, you know him. Oh yes. Uh, he was always uh, following my progress after TOS uh, and the work that I do, and uh, he kept inviting me to join uh, different uh, opening days at the University of Cumbria or uh, or the inauguration ceremony of the of the just. Uh, recently launched the research center on national parks and protected areas. So I, I uh, decided to, uh, to travel to England and I've traveled a few times to England almost every year after the masters, after wow. years, I, I went to visit my relatives and to visit Cumbria and Ambleside and the lakes. And uh, there really it was born the idea together with uh, Chris and, and Ian, uh, who is now my uh, potential supervisor. I mean, it's my supervisor, but I say potential because I'm waiting for the final stage uh, confirmation of funding. We've been working together for two years almost wow. with Ian, Ian Convery. Uh, he's, the, he's the director of the research center at the University of Cumbria for uh, uh, national parks and protected areas and, be, and has been really supportive so far to help me shape my ideas for a future research project. Um, well, <laughs> I had some struggles in there, maybe some uh, not really good uh, foundations of research methods, I must say, <laughs> uh -oh. from the previous education systems. So it, it's been a bit learning by doing in that sense, or a lot of readings and research. Nice, but now, nice. uh, finally, I have uh, I have a research project proposal almost finalized, and that's about Prespa and Cumbria and Wodensee uh, Trilateral Park, which is uh, shared between the Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany. So I, I'm, I'm aiming to start uh, a PhD on governance of protected areas, of transboundary protected areas. So I want to learn about this trilateral park in Europe. And also I want to learn about uh, uh, the national park uh, in Cumbria, in uh, Cumbria, basically the Lake District National Park. 
that's declared UNESCO site as well. So learning from those cases and bring back some recommendations for a better governance of uh, press by lakes in this area of the world. I hope, <laughs> fingers crossed for me, I'm waiting for, <laughs> for the funding during November from uh, the University of Cumbria and the British government. Hopefully they don't uh, decide to put the money for COVID-19. It's just a research project <laughs> for me. <laughs> and yeah. Are you listening out there funding people? <laughs> <laughs> and um, wow, so that sounds, man, wow. That sounds like an incredible project. I really hope you get the funding because I would like to find out what happens with all this. And it sounds like you will be actually the person going up to all of these places, but you're also going to be that person that's going into the Prespa Park and doing the research. So, uh, so again, uh, again, embarking in another journey. <laughs> of well, the it years. sounds like, yeah, I mean, that kind of brings it all back because I have to say, I mean, I have, we haven't spoken, you know, since we were on our transcultural European outdoor studies journey a long time ago, but it sounds like in many ways the journey has never ended. And yeah, just never. go, yeah, I, I agree. It has really never ended. It just, once you, once you, uh, once you, once you go through such a such a journey and such a program, it kind of just follows you forever. I mean, reflecting a little bit back on kind of, I think where this all started, because I remember when Claudia first started the the TEOS program. We keep saying TEOS because it's the Transcultural European Outdoor Studies program. Go, who, where was Claudia Kochi back in the beginning of all of this? I mean, I. I do I remember right? I, I I almost feel I don't know if I should say this, but I almost feel like I remember you'd never even been camping before. Never camping before. I was on my uh, it's back on in my 2012. Suit, on my not not heels. I cannot say heels, but I was with my formal outfit attending conferences in Tirana for political sciences or well uh, in the region. Uh, discussing about conflicts in the region and stuff like that. Uh, and then I started Theos Transcultural European Outdoor Studies. That sounded really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> European Studies. And that outdoor went a bit missed, but we clarified it throughout the program. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember our journey together. And the first time I went... Uh, uh, in a boat and we were doing uh, we were doing sailing in our water sports uh, that's right trip and we shared the boat together yeah so you i think it was also one of the first times you were doing sailing yeah i think i almost sank the boat about 20 <laughs> times and you uh, i think you looked like you wanted to kill me or throw me off the boat or something <laughs> I was just very surprised uh, with our with uh, our instructor from from he, the university because he was like, "It's okay, don't worry, it's just the wind." But I'm flooding. It's I, okay. I have you I've told understand. yeah I've told that story to so many people and I forget I I see this man in my head to this day but I forget his name now but whoever our instructor was on that boat on. Uh, like during the swallows and Amazon's uh, yes. reproduction activity back in 2012 TOS program, that was the the most the calmest, like the best instructor I've ever had. Amazing, it, a model for all instructors ever. This man, we I'd never I had never driven a boat before, or, or or steered like a sailboat before, and this man was so calm. He's just like. All right, Josh, just pull that right there. Okay, no, don't worry that the boat's tipping. Just grab this <laughs> rope right here. Pull it. Yeah, easy does it. Okay, okay, we're tipping a little bit. Uh, no, oh, oh, okay, it's going to be all right. Everybody relax. <laughs> that man was amazing. He should have been given a gold medal. Uh, and and that, because as, as an activity instructor, that's, you, you so rarely get that. A lot of time you got people yelling, screaming, you know, pushing, work harder, all this stuff. And this, wow, that man. But I got a, I have got a big lesson out of that because, yes. uh, uh, well, because I had this uh, good experience with Theos, really. Uh, overall, good experience. 
I, I, I really trust very much professionals or instructors. So yes. if then I came back to Albania and I did climbing or rock climbing basically by, by the sea, I really trusted them, even though I never did that before. I was like, okay, you're here, the, you're the specialist here. If you tell me to do this, I will do this <laughs> and I will manage. And I managed. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I didn't say, I, I, I also, I, I had a big transformation up to that point that I went to teach outdoor sports with University of Sports of Tirana. And wow. They, so I went uh, two years, two consecutive years to do uh, 10 days camping with them by the sea. So they did different sports. Of course, there, was, uh, there were other instructors involved, but I was, uh, I was the teacher, basically. Wow. <laughs> I was teaching them how to camp, how to live together, who is cooking uh, today, who is doing the cleaning of the campsite and all of that. And, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, that's, really, that's, I think I just award everything from Tios and yeah, from all of the group, from all of you, really. It was not just the, the professors. I think our group was amazing and I learned a lot from, from everyone. We already had many people who were very experienced outdoors with, with different sports and, and living. And, yeah, it, and it, I was just attentive listening for two years. <laughs> it was super incredible. I mean, it's the most incredible experience. And I mean, I know a lot of probably former students might be listening right now or in former instructors and professors in that program. And also people who, you know, you come to find out so many other people were involved in putting that whole program together. So I must just say, wonderful job, everybody who put the TOS program together. It was fantastic. And I wish everybody could experience that. And um and life-changing uh, two-year uh, master's program. And I just, I, I'm just uh, so happy to have been able to talk with you today about this and see, you know, wow, how things have just changed and evolved since then. I remember from, I remember Claudia uh, back on first day, never been camping before. A little, I mean, admitted, I think we must have been a bit of a stranger to the outdoors at that point in time. And look at you now, like, large and in charge all the way just up in the leading the world in of the outdoors and education now so this is awesome <laughs> yeah so i think well, thank you. I, I think i think uh i think this has been a really fantastic conversation today and i see that you know it's probably time to round it up again please feel free to stick around a little bit after the show if you'd like but claudia thank you so much for coming on the show and would you like to um leave uh today with any anything other message you would like to send out to the trans natural world or maybe just some ways you know things you might want people to get in contact with you about or if they need to well, I want to thank you very much for thinking to <laughs> have this conversation with me and for the opportunity to share all, uh, all the news from this side of the world <laughs> here in the Balkans. <laughs> uh, and about a message, <laughs> I, I, I really, I don't know what to say, but I've learned that uh, you should really experience things and you should really experience nature so that you can understand better what we all are talking about because you everyone must listen listens around about uh, uh, awareness raising messages uh, a lot is going on everywhere well climate change <laughs> and all these phenomena who seem for some seem very detached and far away and not have happening to them. But I think that um, don't just listen uh, to all of this, just go outside, take the time to, to spend some, some time in the outdoors. Uh, in, in these difficult times of uh, COVID-19, where uh, staying indoors and doing education and well, going to schools is very difficult. Uh, well, why not consider alternative spaces for, uh, for, doing, uh, for doing education? So especially for those schools who are located in open areas or, or national parks, because I'm sure there are many, many schools uh, because many of the parks, at least in the Balkan region, 
uh, are inhabited by people and uh, children are living uh, within these parks. So why not just go and learn outdoors about uh, the history of their place or about uh, nature and all, all of that. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully also our governments decide to just open up their ears a bit about uh, this uh, opportunity that the situation is, is providing. I know that in Albania they are, they are offering this opportunity to decide on some alternative spaces for some subjects to go outside. So maybe just go a little bit more outside. And well, these masks, I hate them. <laughs> I must say, it's not what I like. I hope we get back, everyone gets back to normal life and no more Zooms and no more uh, learning and training online. Learning and training has to happen in person and, uh, and have all that enriching experience in person, not online. So I hope the world goes back to normal as soon as possible. Yeah, all the all the best of the luck for you. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it definitely has not been has not been easy for everybody. But I, I guess one little cherry on top is the fact that I feel like yeah, more people have been uh, getting a bit more in touch of nature recently. Uh, since uh, that's kind of the oasis right now, people want to get out of their house. They want to get away from the screen and stuff like that. They're working from home. They're working online. They're learning online all this kind of stuff. So nature has now been kind of the uh, alternative, which is uh, yeah, a little silver lining, I guess, uh, if there is any during this whole global pandemic crisis. And uh, yeah, Claudia, thank you so much for coming on. It's super wonderful to talk with you. It's an awesome pleasure. Um, and thanks for all the good work that you're doing. And I hope that we can have you back on again in the future, maybe when you're after you've gotten your funding and 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 you're working on this amazing uh, trans-border, cross-border project. Thanks for going out there and connecting people to nature more and connecting people across borders. It's just fantastic. And uh, it sounds like... It'll just keep keep evolving from here. So welcome back everyone and thanks again to Claudia for taking the time to share with all of us all of her wonderful work and stories. I really found Claudia's work extremely fascinating, particularly the fact that when working on a border, one can really be dealing with local and international issues all at the same time. Regional landscapes can determine more about your daily culture, lifestyle, and routine, what food you eat, the weather that you deal with, the recipes that you have in common with others around you. The natural landscape connects people regardless of political borders. This whole story really struck me as sort of a microcosm of the entire world. What I mean is, whether it's three countries sharing the same national park or a whole bunch of countries sharing the same planet, we're all connected by our ecosystem. It leaves me questioning, what is the worth of a sometimes divisive human constructs like flags and boundaries in the face of nature's transcendent impact on culture? Something to think about. Anyways, thanks again, Claudia, for joining us today. And thanks to all of you out there who are listening. Please make sure to subscribe and share to the show and reach out whenever you can. I'd love to hear from you. I'm your host, Josh Bennett, and these were Transnatural Perspectives. Talk to you next time.